If there's one thing that many people can agree on, it's that the Nintendo 64 had a surprisingly low number of 2D games. It seemed that this console generation was all about taking franchises from previous generations and pushing them into 3D. Many did this with great effect, and some sadly fell short of the transition, but very few seemed to master both. Goemon's Great Adventure is the follow-up to the sleeper hit of 1998, which was Mystical Ninja starring Goemon. The Mystical Ninja series was often a Japanese exclusive series, with the first Western release coming on the Super Nintendo, and left us with a fantastic 2D platform game to master. It wasn't surprised therefore that in the early Nintendo 64's lifespan, Konami announced that they were making a new Mystical Ninja game in 3D. What surprised many, however, was that it did eventually receive a Western release. Now, the backstory to that game, though, is for another episode, because considering how well received Mystical Ninja starring Goemon was, it came as a surprise to nobody that Konami quickly began work on the sequel. What was a surprise, however, was that they decided to take the series back to its 2D roots with Goemon's Great Adventure. It's surprising because as much as I loved Mystical Ninja starring Goemon, this game arrived under the radar for me. Considering how much I poured over the pages of N64 magazine, it wasn't until my brother randomly got home from the game store one day with this game on the release day that I couldn't wait to actually get playing it. Also known as Mystical Ninja 2 in Europe, Goemon's Great Adventure was released in Japan in late 1998 and the following year in the West. Whilst the game had changed from 3D back to 2D, one thing that hadn't changed was the developer's absolute wacky sense of humour and a storyline which is perhaps as strange as anything else you can find on the N64. The story begins with Goemon and Abysmaru witnessing Wise Man's latest invention, which is the super gorgeous Ghost Return Machine. This was built to bring back from the dead gorgeous superstars. Enter Bismaru, an evil nun who steals the machine and brings back to life Dochuki, who is the boss of the underworld, as well as unleashing a number of ghosts and sinister beings. The wise old man, like his name suggests, is too old to take on the challenge, and so it's up to Goemon and Abysmaru to travel across five worlds to return order to the world. And so begins one of the most fun and entertaining experiences I think you'll find on the Nintendo 64. Now I mentioned the story about my brother picking up the game a moment ago, and one of the specific reasons why he told me he did this was because the game had a co-op multiplayer mode. We always loved being able to work cooperatively in games, and everything from Streets of Rage to World of Illusion were games which he had fond memories of playing together. For anyone looking for such an experience on the N64, there are surprisingly a limited number of games that actually allow you to do this. And so if you've been yearning for a cooperative experience, then this is the game that you've been yearning for, so don't hesitate to pick this one up. Now there is also a four player co-op mode which can be accessed, but the game wasn't actually advertised with that feature, it was actually a secret. Back to the game, and whilst you'll initially only start out with Goemon and Abysmaru, you'll unlock the rest of the team as you progress. You'll get Sasuke and Ye fairly early in the game, and one thing you'll instantly learn is that you're going to need to master playing as all four distinct characters in order to fully complete the game. Goemon, as the leader of the team, is the most well-rounded. He has five abilities, which are his pipe attack, and this can be powered up, throwing Ryu, which can be upgraded to flame Ryu, his much needed double jump, and his trusty chain pipe, which helps with special blocks. Abysmaru, whilst offering much of the storyline's comedic elements, has five abilities. His main weapon is his spoon, but he also has a solid megaphone, which projects his voice into stone. It sounds strange, and it is, but perhaps it comes in handy, whilst being one of the stranger weapons in any game on the N64. He also has a projectile weapon which are shuriken, and a hip attack as an aerial ability. Sasuke is the smallest and the quickest of the characters, but can also be the most fiddly to learn how to control, and it does take some practice to get to grips with him. Whilst he only has four abilities, they are very highly powered and this includes his daggers, which are thrown when they are at their most powerful state. He can also throw bombs at enemies, and this too can be upgraded to a firecracker bomb for added explosive power. He also has the ability to swim, and with a propeller he can use his daggers while swimming. Ye is a lot of players' favourite in the game, 
As a member of the secret special investigation ninjas, she gives you a lot of information when you meet her in the game's storyline, and she also gives you another character to play as. Her abilities are also limited like Sasuke. She has a katana as her main weapon and a bazooka as her secondary. This can be turned into a homing shot at a higher cost, but this becomes invaluable in some of the later levels when you'll need to clear enemies which are just off screen before platforming. Her main ability is Mermaid, which makes her the most powerful underwater. With so many abilities that are unique to each character, it's no surprise then that the level design has been perfectly crafted to allow multiple routes through to the endpoint. For example, when playing as Goemon, there may be certain ledges that you can only access using his double jump. And with Sasuke or Ye, there will be water pools which you can divert and swim under those levels using those characters' special abilities. This makes the levels much more interesting to play through multiple times, which at various points in the game's storyline will be required. This is because whilst the mission levels are all in 2D, each world also has its own towns which you play through and explore in 3D in a throwback to the previous game. These village levels act as a perfect breakup point from the fast paced nature of the mission levels and allow you to take time to speak to villagers, learn more about the game's story and of course rest and upgrade yourself in time to hit the road again. Importantly however, you'll also need to help certain villagers to earn passes to open up other routes in the game. For example, the first task you'll get is to help Beat Mania get his musical equipment back before his performance that night. This sees you return to a level which you've previously completed, but instead of needing to reach the end point, you'll be scouring the land to find items he has asked you to get for him. Yes, this does inflate the gameplay, uh, but actually it feels quite natural in the context of the game, and you'll never feel like the developer's sending you off on a pointless fetch quest just to get you playing for a little longer. Each of the five worlds also has its own castle which acts as a lead up to the world's boss battle. The castle stages are intense and really test your skills. One thing I loved about the game was that it's just a huge amount of challenge contained in it. Even as somebody that spent hours as a kid with 2D platformers, Goemon's Great Adventure still packs one heck of a challenge in its difficulty. This is further enhanced by the game's interesting day and night mechanic. As you play the game, it will cycle between day and night. Enter a stage in the daytime and you'll be able to test your skills, but enter it at night time and the enemies will become more difficult to kill and there's also a whole ton of enemies which will only spawn at night time and they take much more damage to kill. Then as daylight comes around again they'll quickly disappear. This too adds some strategy to the game, as some levels you want to avoid during the night time because they become near impossible with the heightened difficulty. The day and night mechanic also comes into play with the village sections, because certain events can only take place at certain times of day. Now this isn't anything on Majora's Mask scale, but it does get you thinking about how to best plan and tackle your path through the game. Thankfully though, if you're stuck on a certain level, there's normally an alternative level you can try instead, if you're finding a certain mission too tough. And one of the coolest parts of the game are the boss battles which come in two forms. Firstly, you have mid-level bosses, which you pretty much stay in character for and they give you a classic 2D boss battle that you've likely grown up with back in the day. They are an enjoyable test and pretty much require some pattern memorization and some combat skills thrown in. The end of world bosses, however, see you enter the giant robot Impact once again. This time he comes with Miss Impact, who has taken a shine to and you'll enter a 3D battle with the End of World boss. The End of World Guardians are some of the most creative on the console, and with names like Artitius, Machine, Devil, Death God, you know that they're going to be fun to play against. Controlling Impact and Miss Impact from the cockpit, you'll be duking out against the bosses which have progressively higher hit points to take them down, and so you'll be gently eased into the difficulty as the game progresses. Whilst the pause menu shows you some of the controls for impact and miss impact, there are other moves available to you which the menu doesn't show you, and so I suggest reading a guide before playing the game to make things a little bit easier for you. In a cool touch though, you can also throw the baton between the characters to switch who you're controlling, and so this adds some tactical elements not found in Mystical Ninja starring Goemon's impact battles. Graphically, I think the game is right up there with the best looking 2D games on the console, 
When playing the game it is presented in 2.5D, so you have a two-dimensional movement playing field with 3D backdrops. This helps to keep the game's well, frantic pacing to be honest, and whilst adding some beautiful visuals to Gorpa. With the game's storyline being so crazy, the overall visual representation of the game follows suit. The game's five worlds all perfectly fit the theme that they are designed in. You have Edo, which is the architecture and road style level, Ryuga Island with its coastal theme and underwater elements, Mafu Island with its haunted ghost island feel, the underworld with its almost ghouls and goblin styling, and the floating castle with its huge castle walls and scale to it. The enemies in each world also feel unique, and the enemy design is awesome. Now sure, some of them are straight up oddities, but when many enemies are unique to the worlds in the game, you'll enjoy moving into the next world to experience some cool variation and new approaches that you'll need to learn to defeat them. The scenery is also top notch, and the clever level design means that you can learn, sometimes see alternative paths in the background, so then you'll need to backtrack and look at how to access it. Simply put, visually the game is over the top, often ridiculous, but you'll enjoy everything about it. Saving the best for last though comes the game's audio. In terms of the game's music score, it's honestly one of the best, if not the best, overall soundtrack on the console. Now I know that's what you're going to say, that's a big statement to be making, especially with games like Ocarina of Time to contest with. But what Goemon's Great Adventure does so well is lining the game with a huge amount of epic and interesting musical pieces. Just listen to Ryugu Castle blasting out as you take on the castle in the game and you'll be witnessing one of the best pieces of music written for the N64. While many people will always mention Kirk Hope and Norgate as being perhaps the best overall composers for the Nintendo 64, especially as they created such amazing scores for Rare games over a prolonged period, looking at this game in isolation, I think it's right up there in terms of its quality. What it does so well is it masters a range of different styles. Sure, you have the aforementioned faster heroic track, but then the game can sweep seamlessly into a hypnotic and peaceful arrangement with tracks like Makeki Forest. I can't think of a single bad piece of music in the game from start to finish, and at times you'll just want to stick around in a level just to hear the music carry on. That's how good it is. The audio department must have been working overtime because as well as having awesome music, the effects too are also on point. The weapons, enemies, character noises, and everything else just sounds right. It treads the fine line between having good quality, whilst also having a wide range of different effects so that they never become annoying. There is one gripe that I have with the game however. If like me you love the bizarre songs which were in Mystical Ninja Star and Goemon, you'll be sad to find that they aren't present in this release. But that's not entirely true, because they are in the Japanese version of the game, but for some reason they were pulled from the game for its western release. And this is a big shame, because if you've heard them before you'll love them. And with the game having some RPG elements in the levels, it's not exactly like many people could pick up and play the complete experience if they only played the Japanese version. However, once you know what you're doing, for example if you've completed the game in the West for the first time, then you could perhaps try the Japanese version and it will give you something fresh to play through with all of the added music uh, and the songs back in the actual game. And on an additional side note, they also took out the game's cool movies, including the intro sequence, and instead the Western release just got a static title screen. I mean, come on Konami, anyone buying the game back in the day was likely already a fan of the series, and so we really wanted this kind of stuff in the package, and shortchanging us was pretty mean. As a whole though, Goemon's Great Adventure is quite simply a must-own title. Not just for fans of the N64, but for anyone who loves old school challenging platform games. If you like what you've seen, then you'll know what to expect, and I think Konami knew this. You have the option to play the game with the analog stick or the D-pad, and both feel perfectly at home. It's a rare instance on the console that it's a game which I think will appeal to those who enjoyed the 3D upgrades to series that they loved, but at the same time yearned for a more old school experience of a 2D platformer. And so, for today's topic of conversation, I'd simply love to know who your favourite character was in the game, and what your first memory of the series was. 
Were you excited to get Goemon in 2D when the game came out? Or were you disappointed that we didn't get a true sequel to the awesome Mystical Ninja starring Goemon? I'd also love to know why you think Goemon has been so off the radar for so long, as I honestly think that this is an era now when anything to do with this series would really stand out and thrive. If they released Goemon games in the West back in the day when the market was smaller, just imagine how popular these characters would be in the modern day. As always though, thanks for watching and until next time.